Oh, there you are in the background. Hello. Hi, this is Nikki from My Healthy Beginning. And today we're going to talk about sourcing whole foods. And I have a lot to say in a very short amount of time. I even made myself a cheat sheet because this is when I can go off onto tangents for sure. Uh, and if you have questions, pop them in. Uh, Elaine can get those questions over to us. So the first question to answer is like, why sourcing your food? Why is that important? I think particularly right now, more than ever, it's, it is really important to stand inside of where we spend that money in regards to buying food. Like food is something that we obviously cannot live without, can't get away from. And if you don't grow your own, you might want to start, or you might want to look at what are your options for sourcing food uh, in, in your area. Most of you, I think, will probably be from Minnesota on this call, but we may have others um, far and wide. But the resources that I'm going to give will give you, will provide you with a place to start looking in your own area and then um, some, some connections here right in Minnesota. So the first question I like to answer and why is because it's really important to me to know, to have our kids know where their food comes from. That, that whole idea about being connected to your food. So that when you're walking through the grocery store with your kids and you pull, you know, chicken off of the butcher shelf or off of the deli, that they're just not like, oh, chickens, you know, grow in the back of the grocery store or whatever. Um, or the vegetables, like that just comes from the grocery store. So you could actually just start kind of playing with it by asking your kids those questions. You know, do you know where your food comes from? Do you know where this apple came from? Uh, do you know where this fish came from? And just be playful about it and just really see what their answers are because you might then have in front of you your work cut out for where you want to start taking some of this at-home distance learning. If you could add a whole, you could add a whole like food agenda to that. But, but really for me, it was important that our kids were connected to their food and, and a very young age. I mean, I think my oldest was only I don't know, nine or 12 months old. We started using a CSA, which is community supported agriculture. And then we started buying raw milk directly from a farm. And if you look hard enough, you're, you'll find those sources to serve your family in that way. Um, we started buying our meat in bulk. And then, you know, we just started making little changes over time. You can find local honey. You can, you can tap into your farmer's markets, right? So this is getting a little bit more into the how, but your why, answer that question for yourself. Is it to save money? Is it to eat, uh, you know, a higher quality uh, food? Is it to connect more to your community? Um, is it to build those relationships? Is it because you want to know what goes into your food? One of our farmers says, you are what you eat, eats. So if the pork that you're eating or the beef that you're eating was, you know, raised in, um, what is that, I, the CAFO, C-A-F-O's, Elaine, what does that stand for again in the food fix? It's the, it's the, it's the Dr. Mark Hyman. It's the food, you know, it's like the assembly line of animals in a barn, right? Whether it's cows or chickens or whatnot, they're not getting out. It's like a factory farm. Um, nobody's getting fresh air. Nobody's eating grass. Um, and they're often just standing in their own, you know, poo um, or urine. And so that is not the way that you want your, your meat or, you know, uh, any of your food to, to come from. That's not the case. Um, you want to know what they're being fed. You want to know the kind of environment um, that they are in. Because have you ever thought about this? <clears throat> when we are stressed, what happens in our body? We have this experience of endocrine dysfunction, but that's not how that shows up to us. We just say like, oh, I'm feeling kind of stressed out. Like maybe your head hurts a little, maybe you feel like a little jazzed up or something, right? But what's actually going on is you have literal endocrine dysfunction. So your adrenals are going out, your thyroid's going out, maybe your you know, pituitary or hypothalamus go for a ride. That's why they call it like an amygdala hijack, like your brain gets hijacked and that's where the majority of your endocrine glands are. So um, you've got your pancreas and your adrenals and down here in your midsection, but the, but the idea is um, those get stressed and then those go out and then cardiovascular goes out and then your digestive system goes out. So then we're in a place of stress. We're burping, we have gas, we don't feel good. We have, we have bloating, we have constipation. Okay. So then you have to just look back up here and go, well, so we're mammals, right? So if 
that cow or that, that pig or that chicken is in a complete state of stress um, at the point of slaughter, where do you think those stress hormones then go? Right, they go literally into the meat that you are then consuming. So then you are adding hormones to your body. And we, you know, we know, or we, or, you know, lots of us know or are educated to understand that when we're going to go buy that meat right off the shelf, we want to say no added hormones or antibiotics. We don't want any of that in our food. <clears throat> but it also comes from if, if, you know, different farms have different slaughter scenarios, but like if there's any stress there at all, you're going to be taking that on from the meat that you are eating. Um, it's important for me to feel connected to my community. And sometimes, um, you know, even in neighborhoods nowadays, people aren't as much connected, but I get that sense of community myself from knowing where my food comes from and knowing, you know, who I'm getting my eggs from and, and the satisfaction in feeding my family that really, really great clean food. And knowing that I can then support another person's passion, if their passion is to grow, you know, really great whole real food on their farm to share with their community, that's something that I want to support. And that building relationships piece too. I can't tell you how many times, um, just the other day we were having a conversation about bees and I found out that my uh, neighbor has a little hive that her husband manages, but then they're also really great friends with someone who works at the U and like all the, so, so it's like, we will have honey coming from every direction this summer. And I'm so excited about that because it's like raw, clean honey from our area. Um, and it will cost me less than going to the co-op and buying a quart of raw honey, which I would do and do um, purchase, but it's, it's going to cost less. We can go through more of it because it's just the thing at my house. We go through honey, like milk. I mean, it's crazy. So, so knowing where your food's coming from, uh, educating your kids on knowing where their food is coming from. It was so fun to walk out to the milk barns when we used to pick up our raw milk. And if we were the only family there at the time, Farmer Mike would let us walk around and would let the girls like cuddle up with the calves. And, and it was like such a cool experience. They literally understood and got to see the milking happening. Like it was such a cool um, opportunity. And they really know where their milk comes from. Now we can't drink milk these days because it just doesn't work for us, not even the raw kind. But if um, we could go back to that, I would go back to that in a heartbeat. It's an incredible experience. So the how, how do you source your food? There are several ways of doing that. Um, this is not, it does not depend on where your location is. So uh, the website that's coming to mind, isn't it called Locally Grown, Elaine? Local Harvest or Locally Grown. Every state has their own, um, has their own, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Way to connect with like your farmer's markets. Okay, so I would start with like connecting in with your farmer's market and then have, and it may take having individual conversations with those vendors or finding on a website, the farmer's market vendors, um, and then finding their email address and just say, hey, uh, you know, I'm looking for a source for my beef. Do you, it looks like you sell flowers at the farmer's market. Could you point me in the right direction? And, and normally those people are happy to pass on that referral and start connecting you in because that, that bond grows tighter. It's really cool to watch that communication grow. Farmer's markets being a great place to start um, and then looking through these locally grown pamphlets, brochures, things like that. Um, you can connect in with the local university in your area. Often they do a lot with agriculture um, and can make great connections that way as well. And then natural food co-ops. So I don't like to shop, but I could spend all day in a co-op. <laughs> I'm such a dark. <laughs> Cindy's like smiling back there. I love a co-op. I love the smell. I love the community. I love the culture. I love like what's this new thing or I've never seen that vegetable before. And, and I love to challenge myself in that way. So it's a whole educational experience being in a natural foods co-op. And here in, in the suburbs of Minneapolis, we have such an incredible source of natural foods co-ops. I think we as a family have three different memberships that over time we have accrued, which is awesome. So it's like, if I'm downtown, I can hit up the big one. If I'm you know, in Minnetonka, I can hit one up and then we have a really tiny one close to our house. So I love that. I love supporting our community in that way and kind of being involved from the ground up with one of these co-ops was an incredible experience. They often have things like 
they can connect you with farmers or they can actually tell you about the farm that that the meat comes from or where they get um, you know their fish source or where they get their eggs from and that's really cool because think about how many people aren't actually asking that question that's a really great question to ask is like are these happy are these happy chickens like are these eggs good for our family to be eating um, and I always trust the sources of uh, the food that goes to the co-op for me it, it always feels like a safe place to go into that I know I can buy almost anything off the shelf and not have to question it. Um, one thing too about co-ops is some of them will serve as a drop site for things like CSAs, which if you're not familiar with that, community supported agriculture is what that stands for. And all that means is that you're buying like a share. Okay, so like much like stocks, you're buying a share of something, but then you actually get a box of those goodies either delivered to you personally, most often that happens in some kind of community drop site and a co-op is a great place uh, for, for that. Um, we used to be a part of a CSA where it was one of the more centrally located homes or you know, family from that group. All of our CSA boxes were dropped off at their house and so I would drive to Excelsior once a week um, to pick up our CSA for you know, six to nine months out of the year. So you get an incredible array of, uh, of produce, um, you know, both fruit and veggies. You're going to get things that you don't recognize. Uh, my favorite CSAs have been the ones who include just a one simple kind of leaflet in their um, box every week that says, this guy over here that you don't recognize, this is kohlrabi, you know, and, and here's a way that you might use that. Or they would put a recipe in their box every week which is super fun because you're going to come up against things that you've never seen and you don't know what to do with. And there's nothing more frustrating than wasting food or watching it wilt away. So uh, community supported agriculture is great. And in terms of its cost, there's usually that cash outlay up front, but you'll find over time that you'll save a lot more money buying your produce in that way than you would week by week, you know, showing up at say Whole Foods or your co-op to purchase your your veggies. And then most CSAs are organic. So you want a cleaner food and you want like a smaller trail between you and the dirt. That's really the way to go with uh, the CSAs. I'll share with you a couple of the sources that, that I use and why we use them. So uh, currently we are getting our eggs from a farm called Nature's Pantry Farm and they are in Lafayette, Minnesota. They deliver to our office on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. And these yolks are the deepest, darkest orange I think I have ever seen in an egg yolk. I mean, they are absolutely phenomenal. So good, so nutrient dense. They've got a great blog. They do farm tours. It's really exciting to work that they're doing. Um, do they, I know they carry, they do chickens and beef. Lane, do they do pork as well? Do you remember? They do pork as well, okay. So, so that's one farm uh, option, Nature's Pantry Farm. And again, that's in Lafayette, Minnesota. And, um, and we could connect you here at the office as well. The other farm that I use that is more local is Pasture Addicts, and they are out in Buffalo. And um, they used to do chicken and pork and beef, and um, now they are just doing pork and beef. And they too will offer little farm tours. So. I do love connecting my families out to that farm and they don't mind you popping in, but they certainly love to have that introduction and know you're coming for the first time. They're happy to show you around. And there's nothing more fun than like walking around through the field asking, you know, why the cows are doing this or, you know, why the little chicken house is like way out in that corner. I mean, they answer the questions straight up and then you also get to see farm life for what it is. I mean, we've been on, farm tours before where you, you know, we've seen a pig that way out in like the back 40 got itself tangled in a fence and had died. And though it was so sad to see, like just this is the circle of life. And that is also an important thing to understand. One thing my kids have loved so much about that farm is having gone there for so many years. Um, they have been there, you know, not long after, uh, you know, a calf was born or a litter of pigs were born. And then have had the opportunity to 
um, contribute to the naming of these of these animals. And then it's really fun because then they see them over time and they watch, you know, this little dude that they aptly named Beefstick um, or somebody at the farm named Beefstick. And it turned from this little tiny calf into this big, big cow. And it was so fun for them to watch that progression. And it, I remember Annie saying like, mom, I don't like going to the farm because every time we walk around, the turkeys chase us. <laughs> And so they get this actual experience of what it is to be on that farm and among those animals. Um, and it's a pretty cool, that's a pretty cool opportunity. So one of the other reasons why that I actually didn't touch on before to source food, um, I think I mentioned it briefly, is, is the cost factor. It is so much less expensive to front, let's, I'll use the word invest, it's just like we do here at the practice. We are not used to having people come in who, who are um, understanding that they're going to invest in their health. And we buy junk all day long. We buy things in bulk, we buy electronics, we buy clothes online, we shop and spend and shop and spend. But when it comes to our food, we suddenly wanna put on the reins and buy the cheap crap that doesn't serve us, right? So that doesn't work for several reasons. One of the things I always talk about is the cleaner your food, you know, the less you're going to be in the doctor's office. That is like a direct correlate in most cases for families. And they notice that. They start to notice as soon as they start taking better care of themselves, putting more whole real food into their body, that they find that they're not running to the doctor's office where they're handling a copay every time they go. Um, and in the end, they may have invested more, they may have spent more on their well-being, but they will find that they have spent less. So they'll have more left in their account um, because there's less going to your medications and whatnot. So that's always an exciting thing. And that has been tried and true for sure in our family. Now, because we are getting low on our beef and our cow doesn't come around, I think for another three to four weeks, we buy a quarter of a cow at a time and we do this two or three times per year. We are a family of five and then the dog sort of gets in there in the background sometimes with the organ meats that some of my family members are not as excited about as I am. <laughs> like liver, for example, or heart or tongue. Those are delicious and nutrient dense and all my baby's brains grew up on all of those organ meats and they want to deny that until they just wanted to deny that 100%. So, so right now I'm finding that I'm going to the co-op to pick up beef uh, here and there. And to be honest with you, I'll pick up as a filler, I'll pick up the organic, I think it's the Coleman brand at Costco, but inside of, you know, the circumstance in our nation at the moment, there, I, I can't even buy meat if I wanted to at Costco. So not a bad problem. I'll run into that. I'll run into buying, you know, three or four of those three packs of what is that three to five pounds of you know organic beef from Costco as my filler when I'm running out of beef before the next one comes up and that's if we don't have extra pork in the freezer and extra chicken in the freezer but I'm buying it from the co-op right now and what I find is that if you you walk into the co-op and you don't look for just a pound of hamburger which you know grass-fed is going to be $9.99 to $11.99 a pound that they often have like family packs you know, where they've put a couple pounds of beef together or, you know, um, oh, what do they call that? Like a broiler, uh, boiler chicken, you know, when they have the, the, why am I drawing a blank on that? When it's like pieced apart, as my kids would say, uh, ready for you to go, it's going to be cheaper to buy it in bulk like that. So if it's cheaper to buy, you know, a couple of pounds of burger in bulk, imagine then how much less expensive it is to purchase a quarter of a cow. I want to say at the end of the day, I don't think it's costing us more than $4.99 a pound. I want to say it's about $600 when all is said and done when we, when we buy our quarter. So, um, and you might be surprised at this in terms of where the cost goes because you have your butcher and you have your farmer. So who do you think gets the bigger slice of that? The farmer gets the bigger slice of that because it's the hanging weight of the animal and the butcher just gets the price for processing. So we might have like 150 or $175 processing fee. The rest of it goes directly to the farmer. How cool is that? Right? So we might write a check for whatever, $400, $500 that goes right to that farmer who has four kids, who's generating all this food for the community, which is so cool. And, and then they carefully source their processors because this meat, our meat doesn't have any nitrates. It doesn't have any fillers. There's 
nothing in it. Um, when we get our pork cured, they do that all naturally. So they have recipes that they need to follow in terms of um, how the butcher is handling and processing our meat. So how that happens is we get a call that says the cow is going to butcher and um, the butcher, the processor will give you a call within a week or two. And they call us and they ask us how we wanna process our meat out. So when I say like $6.99 a pound, I'm talking, it doesn't matter if that's a pound of ground beef or a T-bone steak. The savings on a T-bone steak or ribeye is incredible. Like how much are you gonna pay for one of those, right? If you're just gonna go pull it off the shelf. So, so the other thing that we've had to invest in are some, you know, some freezers, freezer space. I grew up, we always had this big, long freezer downstairs in our basement that, you know, had things from 1949 in it <laughs> when you would go to change it out. But we've been able to get away for many years on a smaller, uh, I should ask my husband, the cubic feet of that freezer. Small, like, you know, maybe double the size of a washing machine side by side like that. And that would hold a quarter of a cow, that would hold the pig, that would hold a few extra chickens, plus whatever kind of fruit that we had frozen from picking berries in the summer or ordering our cherries or um, you know peaches in bulk and slicing and freezing those. And so as our family grew, so did our freezer space. So we now have not one, but we have two stand-up freezers in our basement. And it's really pretty funny because both my husband and I, it's like, um, all is well in the world when those two bad boys are filled. <laughs> it's just like nothing like it. Uh, so I know in our in our refrigerator upstairs we have you know it's all produce and and then it's you know nut butters and kind of whatever food we've actually made and some eggs and a few bagged items. But really we're in the market for a new refrigerator because ours is 11 years old and. Chad just said, like, can we just get a straight up refrigerator and not even worry about the freezer part because we have all that extra space downstairs. Um, I like having a little extra freezer space upstairs for all the goodies that the kids make. But to just to give you that idea, okay, best investing in your health might mean you have to make a little space and have, um, you know, enough space to either put that quarter of a cow or maybe you buy that quarter and you split it with a family member or a friend or a neighbor, in which case it's a little easier to break that down even, and then you've cut your cost even more. Um, what else about that price? Um, say for example, chickens, like this summer, we are partnering with Dan and Becky's Market out in Cocado, and we have purchased their fresh hull chickens for years. They do nine butchering days throughout the summer. And I want to say they're like three eighty a pound uh, to be delivered right to us, but they will be literally fresh frozen, delivered right here. And for my family, twenty to twenty four chickens a year uh, as a whole is a great place for us because that allows me to do a whole chicken either in the instant pot or in the grill or the oven, you know, about every two weeks or so. And then you know we definitely get two or three meals, if not more, out of that, depending on who is eating what. So knowing that it's Dan and Becky's market and two other organic farmers, you know, they gather their numbers, they raise 1800-ish, you know, uh, chickens a year. And knowing that process is just, you know, 40 minutes down the road is so amazing. It's supporting their business, which is supporting their families. And then again, I know exactly what my kids are eating and what we're feeding them and what goes into those little chickens, which is amazing to me. So I would rather pay for that upfront than pay those doctor bills um, in, in the end for our kiddos. So Nature's Pantry Farm, Pasture Addicts, um, Dan and Becky's Market out of Cocado are the farm sources I use. We also, we've gone back and forth over the years from a CSA, that Community Supported Agriculture, to having our own garden. Truth be told, I'm a terrible gardener. I do not have a green thumb in me. I'm really jealous of those people who do. It's not something that comes naturally to me. Uh, I either overwater or underwater. So then we went to Straw Bale Garden, which was really, really fun because there was very little weeding involved. And that worked better for a couple of years. I mean, soaker hoses, the whole nine yards, I still managed to mess it up. So we have this really great 30 foot long raised bed garden that I'm hoping we could turn into a chicken coop. <laughs> That's the grand plan. I don't know if my neighbors are going to love it, but you know, if three out of the four say yes, then I'm in. Um, so that's just, you know, kind of being fun and playful. But the reality is looking at how busy we are, both my husband and I are self-employed. A CSA really served us well last summer. And then we just grew some little potted things with the kids. 
my girls are kind of in this state now. They're old enough where they're like, okay, mom, I get where food comes from. I'm over it. Let's just cook. Uh, and the little guy is not as interested in playing in the dirt, like gardening as he is like bulldozing the <laughs> dirt and moving rocks. So I thought maybe I would build a potato tower, which we did a few summers in a row, which was like really great soil. And then we used, um, I think it was alfalfa, if I remember right, and you layer it and then you cover, you know, like make a little circle of chicken wire. So it's just this layer of soil alfalfa and then potato eyes and then soil alfalfa and potato eyes. And then this little, this little, um, this makes me sound like I know what I'm doing, but, but I don't, this is the only thing I was able to grow and probably cause they're just so like sturdy. But then you get the little tower or whatever it is. It's just, you know, two and a half, three feet tall, but then all of, you know, the potato flowers, if you will, or the greens, the vine, you know, is coming out. So it was a cool, that was a cool experience. And then you just go and start like digging in in the fall and these potatoes just start falling out of this tower. So for kids, that's really fun, young and old alike. That's a fun and really and cheap way to do. So I think we'll probably do some of that this summer. Um, I am actually on the lookout for a new CSA. I, I believe our old CSA from last summer um, is not doing that anymore. So I am actually going to check with our local co-op up the road because I do know they have a CSA that delivers right to them and it's a mile from my house. So that's very convenient. Now we have just a couple more minutes. Um, there are two other resources that I use a lot in terms of sourcing whole real food. One of them is Thrive Market. And if you haven't used Thrive Market online, people describe it as like Costco meets Whole Foods online. There's a small membership fee of $55 per year, but so does Costco. Um, and thank you that Costco, we can buy more and more organic foods now, but this food just comes to me and I don't have to leave for it. I go online, I order my food. In the last couple of years, they've also started to add some frozen foods. They have meat, they have seafood. So that's a really, really great source. Also kind of in bulk, like you're buying a, um, you're buying like a pack and it's not like you're just buying a filet of fish. You're, you can buy like packs, which is, which is awesome. So Thrive Market, is really great anywhere between four to six days in shipping and the beautiful thing about it is the price cut so i want to say the discount is between 25 and 50 percent off of what you would normally pay for that justin's almond butter or the hip peas or the dr brenner's or um the seventh generation diapers i mean there are some things that i have found on there that um i won't buy because of the cost maple syrup but we get also get that locally um and uh like co coconut oil seems to be something that I can find organic and cheaper elsewhere. But Thrive Market's a, it's great. We use it a lot for when we're gonna travel, for snacky foods and things like that. So that's a fantastic um, source. The other is Imperfect Produce. And that is a newer one to us in the last year. I would say we've been using that for, um, gosh, what is this? It's now almost May. So I think maybe since December. And what's funny is they didn't deliver to my zip code in the beginning. So I sent it to our babysitter's house <laughs> and she would grab our, you know, our box of veggies and then she would bring it with her the next day. Now what's great about imperfect produce is that it is hundred percent imperfect. Um, the con, if you will, is that it comes from wherever it comes from. It's not like it's just coming, you know, from the farmer's market downtown, which also with farmer's markets, you have to be mindful if you are committed to shopping local, watching for the big dull fruit boxes underneath the farmer's market tables because not all of that food is locally sourced, um, but also the farmer's market is just an experience that I think everybody loves. So I think that's why we use that. But imperfect produce, they're not perfect. You know, my zucchini are often really beat up, but I don't care because they are getting zoodled and they are getting chopped for roasting. And I don't really care what they look like at the end of the day. Um, apples have been great. Like I've never had a problem with any, I mean, right now, some of their delivery is kind of funny. Some of it's delayed, but of course people started to buy food online that weren't before. And so I think that's the only thing as they were trying to understand this supply demand inside of COVID but it's a fantastic resource. Every single week, you get an email that says it's time to fill your imperfect produce order. And you have, I think, three days to do that. Um, they will have some standards set for you. 
So it might say like every week, do you want this offered in your box? Say three avocados. And I'll say yes. And then that week when I go to load my, it's like make my grocery list, right? When I go to load up my order on imperfect produce, I can look to say, oh, you know what? We have like five of them here and we need to eat them. So I'm going to take the avocado off that week. The other thing is you can choose between an organic box and a conventional box. I want to say the conventional produce starts something like 15 or $16 a box. It's, I could be wrong, but it's quite inexpensive. Uh, and I want to say the organic box was between $24 and $34 a week. But we get everything from onions to sweet potatoes to kiwi to tomatoes to asparagus to Brussels sprouts, um, you know, carrots, celery. The celery is always a little bit beat up, like it's off the stock. But again, I don't even care. Most of that we're juicing. Um, and again, we're chopping off the tops and bottoms and putting the tops in to make some sort of stock or broth. The bottoms I put in, in the trash or the compost if one of the kids feels inspired. And um, it, it's easy. So I love when things can come to me and I can spend my time doing things like this or being with my family. So that is a true gift. I will say my imperfect produce order week by week has been somewhere between um, 36 or 37 dollars all the way up to like 70 or 72 depending on what we have going on that week um depending on what i want to use in the dehydrator that week it's another thing my kids really love to use so if i can get more mangoes that week we will slice them you know peel them slice them and put them in the dehydrator and that becomes a really great snack for the kiddos so thrive market and um imperfect produce and then in terms of finding csas you could find those online too you could really like Google CSA with your uh, zip code or um, I bet if you went to even like csa.org, I bet that you would end up with, I don't know that for sure, but I wonder if you would just end up with finding community supported agriculture in that way. So that is just a gist of sourcing whole real foods. I mean, outside of that, there are buying clubs that people can be a part of. Some of those you have to put in a little bit of time, like sorting produce, three hours, uh, you know, a quarter, or you have to put six hours in over a year's time frame, and then you get into some of those. That is an exciting and enticing appeal to me, but as our family has grown and our businesses grew, I just could not wrap my brain around spending the time in that way, and so I have been looking into that because it's, it is still appealing to me, so it's the community piece of it that I, that pulls me. But we've also done, you know, like as our standard buying club where once a month there's a drop site about 10 minutes from my house where again, you're buying all natural and organic foods. I haven't found a huge cost savings, like on some things there is a cost savings on some there aren't, but, but it's also that experience of being able to log in and buying most of what you need, including produce, and then just showing up once a month and picking it up in a few boxes and going home. So, so there are some really, you know, the Azure standard, which is A-Z-U-R-E. Um, I'll have to look and see if I have a link for that, Elaine. I think I just might. That's a really great one that you can find out if that's in your area. And that originates out of Washington State, I believe. Um, I keep thinking of things because <laughs> I bump into all these things where, you know, it's like somebody's putting together like a group order for organic oranges, you know, in the middle of January from a family farm in Florida. You know, you, the more you start tapping into locally sourcing your food, um, not even locally, but just sourcing your food, the more cool resources and opportunities you're going to have. The last one I'll leave you with is every summer we, we love, in fact, Odin this morning painted this picture perfect day. He said, mom, as I held up this big jar of organic jam. And I said, Odin, it's almost summertime where we can make our own jam or we can buy some jam at the farmer's market. And he said, yeah, and then we can go to the strawberry field and we pick strawberries and then we'll be hot and sweaty. And then we can go on the paddleboard and then we can go swimming. And he, I was like, this kid is speaking my language, right? I just loved every second of it. So and more importantly, I love that the picture that paints in his mind of the memories that we've built doing those things. So we love to pick blueberries, raspberries, and strawberries every summer. We totally look forward to it. Often we pick enough to nibble on over the course of a few days, but that also gets us through almost to March of where we don't have to buy frozen fruit, which is incredible savings and really fun and a little bit of like dirty fingernails for two to three weeks in the summer of you know processing these berries. So that's a really fun thing that we do. And then 
one of the orchards that we used to buy, um, they no longer are doing berries. They are doing only just apples now, but they have sister orchards. So a lot of these local orchards in your area will have sister orchards. So this one has a sister orchard in Michigan that's also low to no spray. And so I get bushels of peaches. I get 10 to 20 pound boxes of blueberries um, and dark and sweet cherries. So those usually start to come around in July. We can usually get a load of blueberries and I forget if the there's a tart cherry and there's a sweeter one. One of them comes July and one of them comes August. But I just know that and I plan for it and and we fork out that money and then we just, you know, turn some music on and turn the kitchen into a little processing plant because it's fun and such a cost savings and um, everybody has, you know, stained teeth and fingernails and noses for a few days. Um, so that's all I have in my notes. That was a lot of information. Thanks for sticking around for that. And um, any questions in the future, just reach out to us um, in my Healthy Beginning Facebook page or myself, Nicole hirsch Keekley on Facebook um, or info at myhealthybeginning.com here at our practice.